शिक्षक जन संस्थान शिमला द्वारा आयोजित इस पुस्तक परिचर्चा कार्यक्रम में आप सभी का बहुत बहुत स्वागत है आप सभी से अनुरोध है कि अपना अपना स्थान ग्रहण करें कृपया आशीष कुमार अंशु जी आप भी स्थान ग्रहण करें कृपया इस कार्यक्रम में मैं अखिलेश पाठक जनसंपर्क अधिकारी आप सभी का बहुत बहुत स्वागत करता हूँ कार्यक्रम में हम आज पुस्तकों पर चर्चा करेंगे जो पुस्तकें 2019 में संस्थान द्वारा प्रकाशित की गई थी और इस कार्यक्रम को आगे बढ़ाने के क्रम में मैं सभी आदरणीय लेखकों से अनुरोध करूंगा कि वे मंच पर आए और अपना स्थान ग्रहण करें प्रोफेसर मीनाक्षी देव मित्रा सौम्य शर्मा जी ज्योति सिन्हा जी जगदीश लाल डावर जी विजय वर्मा जी पवन बनर्जी दवे जी आप कृपया आए और स्टेज पर अपना स्थान ग्रहण करें प्लीज Institute for giving me this opportunity to represent my book on this platform. My book approach to conservation and restoration, specific focus on cultural heritage of Shimla, is the result of a two-year uh, research fellowship in IIAS Shimla. Uh, well, uh, before getting to the content and the intent of the book, I'll first like to shed some light on the format. Read through excerpts of the book. Uh, the book is divided into uh, two parts. One that talks about architecture and settlements, and the other that elaborates on the field of heritage conservation. The chapters in both these parts are further divided into two categories, which is the premise and the analogy. Uh, in the premise, uh, I elaborate on my personal view on the subject at hand, which is. Uh, the first one being architecture and the second i take the discussion on architecture to why to conserve and why conservation is important uh, 
and then all of this is based uh, against the background of Shimla. Uh, I'll just, uh, I think I'll go ahead and I'll read through some parts of the book. Uh, I'll start from the, uh, so please stop me if I'm going to find huh? Uh, let us start from the very basics. Every human being, each one of us, has certain basic needs. Some are purely existential and some are related to the complex nuances of a mental and emotional being. As far as our physical presence here is concerned, food, clothing and shelter are probably the three basic needs of every individual. Apart from these, there are various other physiological and psychological needs that govern our interactions and our natural environment and each other. These interactions govern with nature and its varied creations and challenges at an existential level or with our fellow beings or even one's own self at a physiological, mental or emotional level take place in a particular context. This context is that of a specific time and space. Without even attempting to get into the philosophical discussions on time and space, I would just say in a very basic layman language that space can be defined as where everything exists and time can be defined as which enables change in everything everywhere. In order to give meaning to an environment, time and space are the main defining factors as an architect, one's interventions are instrumental in the change of character of a space, absorbing the emptiness that is space at a particular time and then creating a new space in that empty space, thereby giving it a whole new meaning is the pretext of an architect's work. So from talking about what an architect's duty is and how creation of space of a place comes from an empty space and then how the interaction of an individual a community changes the dimensions of the area that we live in so every every place and a city and an urban context has a cultural background to it there's a cultural heritage that further leads to the discussion of conservation and why conservation is important um, to talk about the i'll skip to the uh, why con conservation of cultural heritage Conservation of cultural heritage is a statement which contains very heavily loaded terms that is conservation and culture and heritage. What is meant by cultural heritage? Quite different from the notion of heritage, a place's cultural heritage comprises not only of its built heritage but also the intangible nuances of a society. Culture can be said to be a set of unsaid norms and their manifestations accepted mutually by the people of a society as a basis of their lifestyle, which ultimately defines a social setup of a particular time and place. Therefore, the cultural heritage of a place consists of both tangible, intangible manifestations of and by the society occupying that place at a particular time in history. Now, after focusing on what is cultural heritage, I have in the book, I have laid a lot of uh, focus on the fact that change cannot be delayed. So when a popular idea of conservation in a society is that you preserve things, you keep them as it is and then, and that is why there is a lot of uh, sort of repulsion towards the idea of conservation in our country. Whereas we need to focus on the fact that change cannot be denied, you know, it's inevitable. So we need to do conservation in a way that it maintains and then it helps in progress. You cannot do away with the past, but the future, for the future, the past and our present. We are also creating past for the future in the present. Maintaining that, retaining that in a very sensitive way is what conservation is. So basically conservation is a sensitive approach to your own built environment or unbuilt environment. That is what the book is about and the background of this book, every theory that I talk about is based in Shimla. Shimla can be called a case study because, uh, well, one of the reasons of taking Shimla as the case study was that 
Uh, it's my hometown and I'm uh, not only physically but also emotionally very attached to the environment and I see the changes, the insensitive changes happening around and that's why I chose that Shimla had to be the background of this entire dialogue that I'm carrying forward in the book. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amarji. मैं बताना चाहूँगा कि कहते हैं कि संस्थान ज़्यादातर मामले की और समाज शास्त्र के विषयों पे शोध अध्ययन करता है, लेकिन हमारी अगली किताब फिजिक्स गणित इन सभी पहलुओं को छूती है जो कि बताती है कि भारतीय चरण संस्थान प्राकृतिक विज्ञान और नेचुरल साइंस में भी काफी शोध को आगे बढ़ाना चाहता है।
get all the knowledge that was current in the world then available in Arabic so that people in Baghdad and around that area could uh, become familiar with this and start working on scholarship of their own. So it was essentially a means of promoting scholarship by, by encouraging this kind of translation. And Al-Kindi was the head of this unit uh, which had been set up by the Khalifa in order to carry out this project. He himself was a very versatile uh, author. He is known to have published, uh, written something like 600 manuscripts, of which only about 60 or 70 survived. The rest survived. Uh, they vanished uh, basically because they were destroyed when the, uh, when the Tatars uh, sacked this, the town of, uh, of uh, Baghdad and they destroyed the library and much of his work was lost then. But some of us still survived. And uh, it played a very important role, his work. You see, what they did was they collected all the books that were available in uh, Greek, in Aramaic, mainly. So, for example, the works of Aristotle and of uh, Euclid were translated from the Greek into Arabic and from the Arabic they were translated later on into Latin and reached Europe. So, the, in the sense, the, the Arab scholarship acted as a conduit for uh, knowledge to flow from the Middle East and from Greece into Europe via uh, translations and, and retranslations into Latin. So in a sense, his work is synonym in uh, uh, fueling the European Renaissance which took place later on. Because all the works in Greek had been lost and would have been lost except that they had been translated into uh, Arabic by uh, this, this uh, people scholars working in Baghdad. <coughs> Much like, for example, many of the Sanskrit works now are lost and are all belonging translation from the Tibetan and the Mongolian. That's where the manuscripts are maintained. And they come back to us uh, uh, through retranslation uh, work and we become aware. So the, the uh, Arab scholarship played that role. Other than this, Al-Kindi was what, you would, what we now call a polymath. He was a, a scientist. He was also, he wrote books on astronomy, he wrote books on uh, meteorology, he wrote books on weather forecasting, he wrote, but his main work was on philosophy or optics. And uh, what we are going to talk about, this particular translation that we have done, is of a book of his which is to do with optics and an arrangement of mirrors by which the rays of the sun could be focused and uh, objects could be set alight uh, by, by uh, the fact that a lot of heat was generated. Now, this, this manuscript which, which had been translated, which, which was translated with the help of my colleague uh, whom I will talk about a little later, uh, is actually uh, tells, reveals to you the state of knowledge of uh, optics at, around the 8th, 9th century when this work was written. And it is amazing that it deals with arrangement of mirrors which can be used to focus the sun's rays onto particular objects. And the object being to set that, uh, the objective being to set that object alight because of the heat, intense heat that is generated. And uh, it is clear that from the reading of this book, and this book essentially uses what is known now as geometrical optics. And already he was, uh, uh, was familiar with school, high school level geometry can uh, understand the principle behind the, uh, what, what has been written. So it makes use of the two or three properties of light. One, that light travels in straight lines, what is known as a rectilinear propagation of light. It also uh, shows that Al-Kindi was aware of the law of, reflect, law of reflection. That means the, that uh, the law that the angle of, of incidence between the incident ray and the normal to the, uh, the, to the surface of reflection is equal to the angle at which the ray is reflected. Now this is known as Snell's law. And 
first hop to have been discovered in Europe in the 14th century, but is actually known to the Arabs and to the Arab scholars in the 8th and 9th century. Similarly, he was aware of the fact that the sun was an object which was very far away from the earth and that the rays of light traveling from the sun to the earth are, can be considered to be parallel. And he knew these facts in this derivation where he showed how an arrangement of 24 mirrors could be used to focus the sun's rays. And the reason why he was interested in doing this was because there's a known story associated was associated with the Archimedes. Many of you may be familiar with this. That in the third century BC, that is what almost uh, 20, 2,500 years ago, Archimedes managed to defend uh, the Pope. You see, the port of Syracuse was under attack by the, by the Romans and had laid a siege to the post, at the port. And Archimedes, not Archimedes, Archimedes is supposed to have organized a system of models by which he could set the ships of the Roman fleet on fire. And this is how he managed to beat the siege of, of Syracuse. Now, people for a long time felt that this was all the best stories and that this was not actually possible. But Alkindi in this, in this manuscript has tried to show how, in fact, it could be done. And he has actually given the optics and the geometrical relations which, which could be, uh, or the arrangement of mirrors which could be made by which these sun's rays could be focused. Now, uh, the other thing I'd like to say is the manuscript which has been translated actually is to be found in the Khuda Baksh library in Patna. Khuda Baksh library is supposed to be one of the leading oriental libraries in the country and has many manuscripts in Arabic and Persian. This particular manuscript called Fiyal uh, Shwat is one of the few manuscripts which deal with uh, uh, scientific objects, scientific subjects. And uh, I got to know of it because I come from Patna and I studied in Patna and everybody in Patna knows that the library is one of the uh, uh, you know, most renowned oriental libraries in, in not just this country but in the world. And it was set up by Khuda Baksh who was a postcard and who used to work in the court of the Nizam of Hyderabad. And he used all his money in order to uh, set up this collection of manuscripts, which is to be found in the Kudabaksh library today. Uh, only a word about to my co-translator. I don't know Arabic, but uh, it was done with the help of uh, Professor Hatim Vidyan, who is now a professor of physics uh, in uh, University in, um, in uh, uh, I forget it's skipping my name. Uh, I think it's called Afra, the University of, of uh, Mafraq in Jordan. And uh, he, the reason, the, uh, the way in which we came to know each other was while I was teaching physics in the University in Delhi, he had come as a research scholar do his PhD in theoretical physics and that's when I showed him a copy of this manuscript and we started a collaboration which resulted in the translation of this book. So uh, finally I would like to thank the Institute for giving me this opportunity of completing this work and uh, I hope some of you will be interested in reading and seeing the stuff. I, I think you might be interested partly because it will tell you a little about how much people know in those times and also for those of you who may be interested in the history of science, it, it shows that there is more to science than just Western science and that what it is, what is currently posed or thought to be by Western scholarship to be the result of efforts only in the West, it actually has a uh, international uh, 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 origin, the contributions, fundamental contributions are being made not only from the Arabic world but from India and from China and even the uh, Mahan civilization, the Babylonians and the, uh, and, uh, the, the 
uh, other civilizations of the Euphrates and the Tigris, they have all contributed to, to the growth of what is known as modern science. So, so science is not just Western science, it is international, and this is one of the things where people should become aware of the contributions uh, uh, from various cultures and various societies. So thank you, thank you for this opportunity. And thank you so much, Professor Varna. अब नेचुरल साइंस से फिलोसफी की तरफ दर्शन शास्त्र की तरफ बढ़ते हुए अगली किताब इसका नाम है रेफरेंस एस एक्शन स्पेस एंड टाइम इन लैटर विज्ञानस्टाइन जो प्रसिद्ध दार्शनिक विज्ञानस्टाइन पर आधारित है इस इस सीरीज की जो फर्स्ट बुक थी उस पर एक प्रोग्राम हमने लास्ट ईयर भी इसी प्लेटफॉर्म से किया था और मुझे बहुत खुशी है कि हम आज दोबारा उसकी सीरीज की सेकंड बुक पे कार्यक्रम करने जा रहे हैं प्रोफेसर इलाशी देव मित्रा इज दर ऑफ द बुक और उनका मैं परिचय देना चाहूंगा Professor Inakshir Mitra did her PhD in philosophy from Jadapur University, Kolkata in 2004. She has been teaching in the Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi since 2005. Broadly speaking, her areas of research and teaching include analytical, analytic philosophy, philosophy of language, logic, philosophy of mind, and philosophy of action. She has published widely in the areas her special interest remains the philosophy of Latin Wittgenstein, a book titled Latin Wittgenstein on Language and Mathematics, a known foundational narration was published in by the Institute of Advanced Study in 2017. Just before the last year's program, I will welcome you to the next book. I will ask you to please represent your book. Thank you so much, Dr. Yeah, I will just repeat the the title of the book is Reference as Action, Space and Time and Later Wittgenstein. Uh, the professor uh, um, uh, Akhilishti did uh, uh, talk about a transition from um, you know, uh, area of architecture, uh, then physics to philosophy, but I would say this uh, theory is not entirely unrelated to the book. You know, the previous two theories of the book, you know, you know, in a broad sense, uh, it is related as we uh, shall go to see. But to, this book attempts to bring several areas of philosophy together, namely philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, and philosophy of action. And I think it also manages to cast a side light on the issue of morality or ethical judgments in relation to the topic of action. And all this is done uh, within the framework of what Krishna's later philosophy. So, as I said, that you know, starting with uh, philosophy of language, you know, how the chief concern, as you all know, I would try to say this as, you know, broadly as possible and not uh, as in jargons which belong to all the philosophy. Uh, so the major concern of philosophy of language is to see how language relates to reality. And there I see a standard reference, uh, standard theory is to say that uh, there are uh, bits of uh, reality in this external world uh, which are all, all over the world, and to which words latch on, irrespective of any interpretation, any description, any relativization. And Wittgenstein, Vita Wittgenstein particularly, he will not hold this view. And he would hold that this view, it actually harks back on a fetishized notion of space and time, which underlies uh, the commitment to this stolid, impenetrable reference. Uh, space and time, on this theory, this kind of traditional theory, uh, they turn out to be bare outlines surrounding the reference and rather they seem to be ethereal husks in which the reference are contained. So space and time to become the purely quantitative boundaries of, and thus they secure the reference, the objects smartly in those boundaries <laughs> with their primary referential identities. And it is those invaluable quantitative identities, you know, of the reference which are kept intact, you know, can, kept intact in terms to the influences of all differences, all interpretations, all aspectual variations, everything. And incidentally, two very major theories of reference, you see, which are mutually opposed to each other, the descriptional theory and the non-descriptional theory of reference, both of them, with each time, Wittgenstein's texts actually show that both of these two mutually opposed theories actually hark back on this fetishized notion of space and time. So I have sought to utilize Wittgenstein's later texts 
particularly philosophical remarks and settle, you know, uh, where he would say rather than settle that there is no external reality in the shape of terminal units of space and, and you know, there are no already given words and gaps running from one unit to another. Rather for later Wittgenstein, reference is a language game. It is a mode of activity, you know, where we project the reference like we put the pieces of the board before the start of the game, but we do not bang our heads against certain, you see, uh, immaculate quantitative boundaries where in which the reference are encased. Rather, we project these boundaries, putting up the reference as the starting point of the game. So it is not ontology, but a mode of employment. And it's a heavy conclusion, it's a, it's a very it's a significant conclusion which I keep on repeating in many junctures of this book that it is our actions that break, bend, blend space into actions and their interrelations. Now I would like to say that it is at this juncture that you know I make a transition from philosophy of language to philosophy of action. That is I should rather say that how with philosophy of language we cannot simply be confined to uh, the discussing reference of noun words and adjective words. But you see these uh, references of nouns and adjectives should inevitably uh, lead us also to the reference, reference issue pertaining to verbs and adverbs. This I would like to you know burst as one of the you know kind of uh, novel uh, engagements, style of engagements and why this transition has to be done from philosophy of language to philosophy of action. Because as I was saying that, you know, Wittgenstein says it is the actions which create space. Actions are not in space, but actions which bend, bend, uh, blend and break space. And there, you see, there might be a backlash. There might be a regressive theory from the action theory saying that, look, actions are caused by the already pre-given immaculate identities. You cannot say that actions break blend blind space because actions hark back on this referential identity. So here Wittgenstein has again to take this parallel engagement or rather I should say that to the related engagement to show that how actions break uh, bind in blind space. So and uh, and here you see the in discussing the ontology of action uh, there uh, we find that Wittgenstein would be significantly against saying that actions are just brutal physical movements of the limbs and the intentions or the manners of action just they fall apart. Wittgenstein would be saying that intentions and the physical movements, all these things are blended together in the immaculate single soul. So I would uh, say that uh, uh, that this book uh, uh, seeks to bring uh, many uh, uh, parallel engagements together. It inevitably uh, like in, leads to ontology of action, ontology of intention, philosophy of space time. Uh, I mean, the, the, the non technical and the philosophical aspects of Einstein's theory of relativity, philosophy of perception, uh, moral issues, ethical judgments, and um, Wittgenstein's uh, one of the uh, one of the essays on Wittgenstein's freedom of the world, which Wittgenstein wrote on freedom of the world, which is not much discussed, rather remains obscure. This has been, uh, analysis of this has been uh, you know, accommodated. And uh, in a particular section, I have also tried to discuss uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, non -cons the the conceptual and the volitional character, the conceptual and the volitional character of sexual acts which have tried to relate with the very standard and the technical uh, areas of philosophy and language. To mention a few more details that this work incorporates, uh, like a detailed narration of the recent, of a very recent uh, neurological theory of perception on uh, perceptual demonstratives by or after Paris. Then there are, have been small inputs on uh, William James, um, on Alvanar's inactive theory of perception, and uh, an elaborate section on Wittgenstein's view of color perception. So, which also have, uh, is not always discussed in relation to philosophy of language or reference at least. So, I have uh, I've tried to you know, kind of uh, draw lines of connection between all these issues. Um, uh, the, and also the uh, the, uh, yeah, as I was saying that, you know, the uh, philosophical nuances of 
uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. And to mention the last chapter on uh, truth and reference, because it, it was a reviewer suggestion uh, that, you know, uh, when the, my book was under review, the reviewer suggested that, you know, without truth, without the issue of truth, and how truth and reference are related together, this book uh, cannot be complete. So I have uh, included uh, uh, a section on um, uh, self reference and truth as well. So if uh, you know, uh, I am needed to wait uh, for any part of the book, I had selected two very small portions. Um, This is a quotation from Wittgenstein partially. We have a feeling that our actions and conceptions are triggered off by an alien world, which we confront only at the edges, or that what we are strictly given are only tiny pictures taken from an object distorting angle. The, 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 uh, yeah. uh, we have a feeling that our bodies and the movements confine us to a fragment of the full world, that we see space perspectively, or that our visual space is in some sense brought towards the edges. So here Wittgenstein is talking about an inactive perception or participatory uh, realities. It is not that our it is not that our conceptual our linguistic tools are left untouched by the world, going on in its own way. Rather when we act or move about, we are immersed in the world, not discharged by its periphery. Uh, I would also like to read uh, the conclusion. Actually, I did not, this book doesn't have a formal conclusion because I was, this book is in any case so uh, bulky that I got exhausted by the, uh, when, when, I, when I was finishing it. So, uh, you know, this conclusion is rather an expression of my exhaustion. I have exhausted myself in this long and tortuous narrative. You know, because I've read, uh, written six chapters and very, very long chapters, and altogether the uh, book is, you know, kind of uh, about uh, more than 500 pages. Uh, I have exhausted myself in this long and tortuous narrative with no excess resources to construct a ceremonial exit gate. I have tried to give an honest explanation of the later Wittgenstein's approach to reference in parallel addressing some other standard theories as well. I have sought to highlight some tantalizing tracks of similarities that may seem to obtain between Wittgenstein's approach and certain other models of reference, only to work out ultimately their irreducible differences. There is a vast corpus of literature on the later Wittgenstein, though not too much on the specific topic of reference. There is no systematic uh, discussion or writing on uh, reference or description as far as later education is concerned. This work can make a significant addition to the already existing literature, even so far as it can motivate one to go on describing the landscape in real time and not to build bridges, to pull apart all ceiling lumps, knots, and joints of space into a flat stretch of activities, to go on blending the external with the internal, reference with description, activity with passivity, the public with the private. Thank you. And I thank you, thank us again to nurture my project and to, to publish the work and to invite uh, my, uh, uh, me uh, to give a chance to talk about my book. Thank you, Akhilesh. Thank you, Professor Nakshi. Thank you so much. So from architect to natural science to philosophy to now let's move towards the classical music. And then our next book is in Hindi, which also shows the work of diversity done by the IAS. The Abhi Kitab hai Banarsi Thumri ki Parampara, Me Thumri Gaikao ki Chinokia Eva Mupladiya by Dr. Jyoti Sinha. Or Inka Pariche Dona Chahuna, Dr. Jyoti Sinha 2015 se leke 2017 tak Bharatiya Children's Sistan ki Adheta rai thi. आपकी शिक्षा बनारस हिंदू विश्वविद्यालय वाराणसी से संगीत में पीएचडी किया उन्होंने तथा ललित नारायण मिथिला विश्वविद्यालय दरभंगा बिहार से उन्होंने डिलीट किया है इनके प्रकाशित प्रमुख कृतियां हैं संगीत सारांश एक और दो स्वतंत्रता पर समाज में संगीत सेवा की स्थिति नए सभी के नए सरकार भोजपुरी लोकगीतों को लोकगीतों के विविध आयाम राग रोग व रोगी संगीत चिकित्सा संगीत प्रवाह आपके सौ से अधिक शोध पत्रों का राष्ट्रीय व अंतर्राष्ट्रीय पत्र पत्रिकाओं में प्रकाशन हो चुका है 
आपने सहभागिता की है अनेक राष्ट्रीय और अंतर्राष्ट्रीय संगोष्ठियों में सहभागिता हो रही है आकाशवाणी और दूरदर्शन में भी ये कलाकार रहे हैं और संप्रति प्रवक्ता संगीत राज राजेश्वरी महिला विश्वविद्यालय जौनपुर उत्तर प्रदेश से तो डॉक्टर ज्योति सिन्हा जी आपका बहुत बहुत स्वागत है मैं आपसे अनुरोध करूंगा कि आप अपनी पुस्तक बनारसी ठुमरी की परंपरा में ठुमरी गायिकाओं की चुनौतियों के बारे में सभी को बताएं सबसे पहले मैं मंच पर आसीन बदबत जनों का अभिवादन करती हूँ और इस सभागार में बैठे हुए सभी प्रबुद्ध श्रोताओं का अभिनंदन करती हूँ और साथ ही धन्यवाद देती हूँ भारतीय चौधरी संस्थान का जिसने मुझे इस कार्य को करने का एक गौरवपूर्ण अवसर प्रदान किया हमारी पुस्तक प्रकाशित की और पूरे इस विश्व पुस्तक मेला में इस लेखक पर चर्चा लेखक मंच पर ले, हमारे पुस्तक की पर चर्चा के लिए मुझे आमंत्रित की किया इसके लिए मैं हृदय से आपकी आभारी हूँ और शुक्रिया अदा करती हूँ प्रोजेक्ट का था कि बनारसी ठुमरी की परंपरा में थोड़ी गायिकाओं की चुनौतियां और उपलब्धियां उन्नीसवीं बीसवीं सदी उन्नीसवीं बीसवीं सदी कहने का मेरा एक विशेष अर्थ यह रहा कि उन्नीसवीं बीसवीं सदी में एक विशेष गायिकाओं का वर्ग था जो जनरल बाइक जी के नाम से जानते हैं और करीब सौ सालों तक का जो संगीत का एक संरक्षण करते हैं उनके कोठों पर ही हुआ देखा कि इस विषय पर कार्य तो हुए लेकिन किसी एक गायिका को लेकर चाहे मदाधन अख्तर हो चाहे सिद्धेश्वरी देव हो चाहे रसूलन बाई हो उनके कलागत वशिष्ठ को उनकी गायकी को लेकर कार्य तो हुआ लेकिन उस उन्नीसवीं बीसवीं सदी में जो पूरे भारत की जो स्थिति थी जो आंदोलन थे जो स्वदेशी आंदोलन या स्वतंत्रता आंदोलन या मेरा सुरक्षा या सुधार आंदोलन उनका प्रभाव इनके कोठा संस्थान पर इनके जीवन शैली पर इनके कलाओं पर कितना पड़ा और उन्हें उससे उभरने के लिए कितना संघर्ष करना पड़ा फिर भी उन्होंने उस प्रतिकूल विषमताओं में किस तरीके से भारतीय संगीत को भारतीय संस्कृति को संरक्षित रखने का प्रयास किया और उन्हें कितना जुझना पड़ा उस इस विषय को लेकर इस बिंदु को लेकर हमारा यह कार्य इस पुस्तक में है और जब हम बनारस की बात करते हैं बनारसी ठुमरी जिस तरीके से लखनऊ जब लखनऊ की ठुमरी बनारस में आती है और किस तरीके से वो कलागत रूप से वैशिष्ट होकर वो किस तरह बनारसी ठुमरी बन जाती है यह वहां की जो बाइया थी चाहे वो हसना बाई हो विद्यावरी बाई हो जगदन बाई हो या रसोलन बाई हो बड़े मोती बाई हो क्योंकि जो प्रयास था उनकी जो रियाज थी उनकी जो साधना थी उनका जो श्रम था किस तरीके से वो लखनऊ ठुमरी बनारसी ठुमरी होती है और किस तरह से पूरे भारत में बनारसी ठुमरी के नाम से यह विधा प्रतिष्ठित होती है हमारा मुख्य फोकस इस विषय पर यह रहा कि किस तरीके से लोक में उत्पन्न एक विधा ठुमरी दादरा जैसी शैलियां जो कोठों की संस्कृति पर पुष्पित और पल्लवित होती है और इन गायिकाओं के प्रयास से किस तरह से लोक से उत्पन्न एक विधा किस तरीके से राज दरबार में जाकर श्रद्धायमान होती है फिर कोठों पर आसरा पाते हैं और पुनः लोक में आकर आफ्टर इंडिपेंडेंस लोक में प्रतिष्ठित होते हैं और किस तरह इन गायिकाओं का भी एक सफर किस तरह से ये समाज में देखी जाती है किस तरीके से ये राज दरबार में रहती है रियासतों में रहती है इनको बहुत मान सम्मान मिलता है उसके बाद किस तरह ये कोठों पर आसरा पाती है और किस तरीके से समाज इनको उपेक्षित और बहिष्कृत करता है अपने समाज से और फिर पुनः किस तरीके से जो कोठों का उन्मूलन होता है जमींदारी प्रथा का उन्मूलन होता है रियासतों का विलीनीकरण होता है और हमारा देश स्वतंत्र होता है तो नई तकनीकी माध्यमों से इन कोठे वालियों ने अपने अपने अस्तित्व को बचाने के लिए किस तरीके से ग्रामोफोन से रंगमंच से सिनेमा से किस तरह से अपना जुड़ाव रखा और किस तरह घर घर में अपनी गायकी को और अपने को प्रतिष्ठित किया ये एक जो सफर रहा कि बाईस से देवे होने तक का सफर सिद्धेश्वरी बाईस से अख्तरी बाईस से देवे अख्तर या सिद्धेश्वरी देवे होने तक का जो एक सफर है ये केवल एक गायकी का सफर नहीं है केवल एक एक विधा का सफर नहीं है बल्कि एक पूरा इसके अस्तित्व का सफर है कि किस तरीके से उन्होंने ऐसे समय में वो आठ दस भाषाओं की ज्ञाता होती थी जब स्त्री शिक्षा पर बल दिया जाता था कि स्त्रियों को पढ़ना चाहिए ऐसे समय में वो आठ दस भाषाओं की ज्ञाता होती थी और उन्होंने इतने अच्छे साहित्य इतने अच्छे शेरों शायरी गजल जिसका उन्होंने दिमाग चाहे वो जानक बाई हो चाहे वो मलका जान हो या गौहर जान हो इन्होंने इतने शेरों शायरी और कविताएं लिखी लेकिन उसका उल्लेख कभी भी एक लेखिका के रूप में या उन्होंने इतने गीत बनाए इतनी बंदिशें बनाई और उनका धोन बनाया उसको प्रस्तुत किया लेकिन कभी भी उनको एज ए वाग्यकार के रूप में कभी उनको वो स्थान नहीं मिला मेरा यही विषय है कि हम इनके व्यक्तिगत जीवन को 
हटाते हुए दूर करते हुए इन्होंने संगीत के लिए क्या किया और किस तरीके से स्त्री अस्तित्व को स्त्री शक्ति को प्रदर्शित किया नई चीजों से अपने आप को जोड़ने के लिए उस पर कार्य करना हमारा एक एक स्त्री होने के नाते एक शरणार्थी होने के नाते और संगीत विधा से जुड़ा होने के नाते और विशेष रूप से बनारस से जुड़ा होने के नाते बनारस की कोठे वालियों पर काम करना हमारे लिए निश्चित मेरे लिए फर्ज की बात थी और इस कार्य में चूंकि बहुत अलग से कोई कार्य हुआ नहीं और यही प्रवृत्ति थोड़ी रही कि एक तो महिला ऊपर से तलाश कोठे वालिया तो ये बहुत यहां से थोड़ा परे रखने की प्रवृत्ति जो रही वो हमें दिखाई देती है तो मैं इस पर एक संपूर्ण जहां से भी रोजा मिल सकता था काम इसके लिए मैंने समकालीन तत्कालीन साहित्य को देखा जैसे प्रेमचंद जी का सभा सदन या भारतंदु जो बहुत ही ज्यादा बनारस की इन बाई जी लोगों के संपर्क में बहुत अपनी साहित्य गोष्ठियों के माध्यम से रहते थे या इनकी गोष्ठियों में इनका आमंत्रण होता था और जयशंकर प्रसाद जी जो साहित्य और संगीत का एक रिश्ता उस समय हमें दिखता है तो किस तरीके से समकालीन साहित्य में इन बाई जी लोगों को एक चरित्र के रूप में या इनके कार्य के रूप में या दर्शाया गया तो मैंने उस सिलसिले में प्रेमचंद जी का सेवा सदन और हामिद रसवा का उमराव जान अदा अमृत लाल नगर की ये कोठे वालियां फागुन के दिन चार बाहती गंगा बहुत सी पुस्तकें हैं जिनमें से उन मैटर को निकाल कर इनके पक्ष में रखना हमारे लिए निश्चित रूप से मुश्किल था लेकिन मैंने थोड़ा प्रयास किया है कि किस तरीके से वह सामाजिक परिस्थितियां वो सामाजिक परिवेश किस तरीके से इन बाई जी लोगों के अनुकूल या प्रतिकूल था बनारस के रलिशों और संरक्षकों ने या जमींदारों ने या राजा महाराजाओं ने बनारस के जो महाराज थे उन्होंने भी इन बाई जी लोगों को कितना एक आर्थिक रूप से धरातल प्रयाण किया किस तरह से एक वो दायरा बनाया इनके गीत संगीत को प्रसारित रखने के लिए और किस तरीके से उन्होंने महोत्सव के माध्यम से चाहे बड़ा मंगल हो गुलाब बाड़ी हो किस तरीके से विभिन्न उत्साह महोत्सव के माध्यम से इनको एक आधार प्रदान करने का प्रयास किया तो रहस्यों और संरक्षकों या जमींदारों क्योंकि भी बात हमने की है प्लस उन मेलों की उन महोत्सवों की उन संस्थाओं की भी बात हमने की है कि जिन्होंने इनको एक स्पेस दिया और उसके पश्चात ग्रामोफोन एक जो ग्रामोफोन हम उन्नीस सौ तीन चार इसी में हम देखते हैं कि ग्रामोफोन कंपनी आती है तो आपको मैं बताना चाहूंगी कि इस ग्रामोफोन कंपनी पे सबसे पहले दस वर्षों तक इन बाई जी लोगों ने अपना सिक्का जमाए रखा जिसको कहते हैं दस वर्षों तक बाहर जान जिसको हम कहते हैं कि ग्रामोफोन की जान और वो जब गाते थे या जान की बात जब गाती थी ग्रामोफोन में तो गाने के बाद लास्ट में बोलते थे माई नेम इज गाहर जान या माई नेम इज जान की बाई तो ये एक उपस्थिति अपने जो प्रदर्शित करने की उपस्थिति लोगों को बताने की जो एक ये थी कि उस समय में जब वो बोलती थी माई नेम इज गाहर जान या माई नेम इज जान की बाई तो हमें उस चीज को देखना चाहिए कि तत्कालीन समय में स्त्रियों की जो दशा थी तत्कालीन समय में जो स्थिति थी उससे वो कितना आगे थे और इन तकनीकों के माध्यम से शुरुआती दौर में जितने भी हम सिनेमा देखेंगे और रंग मंच या पार्सी थिएटर इन बाईजी लोगों का हम वहां पे प्रभुत्व देखते हैं और शायद बहुत बड़ा एक कारण ये भी था कि सब लोग कहते थे कि ग्रामो फिल्म में गाना अरे पुरुष गायक या सभी घर के जो कहते हैं सौ पर जो गायिका ख्याल गायक या धूप धुमार गायक गायिकाएं थी शायद शुरू में उन्होंने शुरुआती दौर में इसीलिए ग्रामो फिल्म या सिनेमा या रंग मंच में न जाने का फैसला लिया था लेकिन हम देखते हैं कि सिनेमा हो चाहे ग्रामो फिल्म हो चाहे रंग मंच हो या थिएटर हो कुछ भी हो इन गायिकाओं का दबदबा हमेशा रहा है तो हम क्योंकि व्यक्तिगत जीवन को न देखते हुए हम ये देखेंगे कि किस तरीके से तत्कालीन परिवेश में तत्कालीन परिस्थिति में और सबसे ज्यादा टैक्स पे ये बाई जी होती थी जब इतनी प्रॉपर्टी की वो थी आज टैक्स की इतनी बात होती तत्कालीन समय में वो बाई जी सबसे ज्यादा टैक्स पे होती थी तो हम देखते हैं कि किस तरीके से सौ साल का जो बाजी बनी शाह का को नजरबंद किया जाता है उस समय से जो एक जो ढाल है संगीत का जो हम देखते हैं कि किस तरीके से और सन अठारह से छप्पन से उन्नीस तक का सौ साल का जो ये सफर एक स्त्री अस्तित्व का सफर इस दृष्टिकोण से मैं इस किताब में रखने का मैंने प्रयास किया है और सात अध्यायों में मैंने अपने किताब को किया है और कार्य को पूरा करने का प्रयास किया है मैं चाहती हूँ कि आप पुस्तक पढ़ें और थोड़ा इन बाईजी लोगों के प्रति जो एक हमारा अभी भी एक नाम से ही तवाइफ नाम से ही जो एक हमारे दिमाग में जो नकारात्मक सोच आती है तो उनके उस पहलू को भी देखने का प्रयास करें जो उन्होंने हमारे संगीत को हमारे समाज को दिया धन्यवाद 
बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद डॉक्टर जटी सिन्हा जी आपने बहुत अच्छे से अपनी पुस्तक के बारे में बताया अब अगली किताब के बारे में हम बढ़ेंगे ये किताब फिर एक नए विषय को छूती है किताब का शीर्षक है फूड इन द लाइफ ऑफ मिजोर्स फ्रॉम पी पी कॉलोनियल टाइम्स टू प्रेजेंट एंड एंड डॉक्टर जगदीश लाल बाबा इज दी ऑथर ऑफ द बुक आई एम आई एम रीडिंग अबाउट हिज अबाउट हिज बायो डॉक्टर जगदीश लाल बाबा फाउंडर हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ हिस्ट्री एंड एथनोग्राफी मिजोरम यूनिवर्सिटी आइजवाल वॉज डीन स्कूल ऑफ सोशल साइंसेस बिफोर रिटायरिंग फ्रॉम द मिजोरम यूनिवर्सिटी इन अक्टूबर टू He has guided PhD scholars both in Arunachal University, Rajiv Gandhi University, Itanagar, and Mysore University. He was visiting scholar at the Russian Cultural Center for Environment and History, Russian Cultural Center for Environment and History, Ludwig Maximilians University, Munchen, Germany, from June to July 2011. He has been fellow at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla, from May 2016 to April 2018. He has presented papers in various conferences in India and abroad, besides contributing papers to various journals and as chapters in edited books. He has written Cultural Identity of Tribes of Northeast India, Movement for Cultural Identity Among the Adis of Arunachal Pradesh. So you are most welcome, Professor Bawa, and I request you to pre present your book. Uh, first of all, let me welcome everyone. Uh, for sparing some time to listen to us and uh, i thank uh, indian institute of advanced study uh, uh, to give me fellowship for two years and this work is the product of uh, this fellowship uh, i spent about 30 years in northeast india and uh, most of my works are related to the cultural identity of the tribes uh, besides on uh, working on uh, various uh, Uh, fictional narratives uh, from historical point of view and uh, in 2013 i got i was awarded uh, major research project from ugc uh, on um, the social history of uh, food uh, in northeast india and that was a different focus and here in this institute i uh, developed a different theme now uh, you know uh, the food area of, as a food as area of research has been neglected for quite long time in india especially though in western country which is well uh, food history is uh, well researched but in india also uh, especially in bengal there are three to four works uh, which are very powerful works on the history of food uh, i have tried to see uh, the food from the food as a window through which you study the cultural history and uh, uh, in this book i will just uh, read the central theme because there is very little time the book is uh, about production distribution and consumption of food and impediments to this due to natural and political forces since 19th century in mizoram While the focus is on food consumption practices, this study is a broad negotiation with colonial and post-colonial modernity, wherein bakery products, milk, and restaurants represented sites of such modernity, with which the Mizo people transacted the transacted and constructed a, a Mizo version of modernity. we eat food but we we only think from where the food is coming who is producing food how it is marketed what are the modes of production and then how it is distributed and various consumption practices uh in the introductory chapter i just sum up the various chapters in the introductory chapter i have uh, discussed the various approaches to study the food history Uh, in the second chapter of, uh, that is titled food production and environment and intervention uh, the, in this chapter an attempt has been made to study the agricultural practices of the mizo since 19th century and the continuities and changes in the modes of product, food production how besides the agrarian other sources of food production have also been taken that is hunting fishing etc 
The third chapter deals with ecological phenomena of bamboo flooding and food crisis. In Mizoram, uh, you know, there was an ecological phenomena of, uh, which used to occur after every 50 years. The bamboos used to flower and suddenly the rats population to uh, grow because the rats were very fond of the seeds of the uh, flowers and it used to create some sort of famine and they were in shortage of food and in this chapter I'll discuss the various uh, how the measures coped up with this uh, shortage of food practices and what were the ecological, social, political uh, impact and economic impact of this uh, crisis. The fourth chapter deals with food and non-nature conflicts and contradictions. How the measures are not only to meet the challenges posed by natural disasters, but also various political powers which disrupted their food ways. This chapter revolves around the issues arising out of these conflicts. Uh, I have touched since the 19th century uh, conflict with the British and then the British uh, annexed this area in 1890 and ultimately uh, after independence again there was a food crisis of 1959 uh, resulting from the bunny and food and rat famine. Now there have been a long uh, held opinion that Food crisis of 1959 created the base for insurgency in Mizoram, which started in 1966 and, con and ended in uh, 1986. For 20 years, they fought the Indian Army, which exerted uh, the army had taken various measures to uh, contain the insurgency, and one of the measures was the grouping of the villages. Where group villages, where villages were grouped together and put in on the national highway uh, and uh, grouped into a one village. They were displaced from their history, from their culture. And it created a food crisis because they were shorter of food and they had to show their identity cards to the army and go for, uh, you know, whole day they had to, you know, take for coming and going and there was hardly time for the shifting cultivation. Uh, and in this chapter, I have used in a massive way the literary sources, especially the poetry, the folk, lit uh, folk literature, the folk songs, and uh, various literary, uh, uh, fictional narratives, both in Mizo, in Hindi, as well as in English, and how they have represented uh, uh, this crisis and this conflict. Chapter 5, uh, in a very long chapter, it's a uh, chapter. Uh, is titled as creating new tastes. How did the Mizoram negotiate with the harmonic forces of colonialism, Christianity, and mainstream Indian culture in terms of taste? I have defined the various theories of first of first section. I have discussed the various theories of taste. What is a taste? How did the Mizoram public constructed food as a site of forging identity in the process of negotiations with these hegemonies? Uh, an attempt has been made to explore those seminal questions in this chapter. Basically, uh, the first, chapter, the, uh, first section deals with the taste, and then second, how the missionaries as well as the colonial officials looked at their food practices. They condemned the Muslim food practices and it is also related with the, the question of sanitation. They condemn that this is a dirty food, dirt, the Muslim li living dirt, and, they, and then they finally uh, attack their uh, practices of taking the zoo. Zoo is a, some sort of rice beer, it was part of their culture because in their uh, religious practices also, before going to hunting, they used to offer to their gods uh, the rice beer. And the machines attacked this rice beer. But there was a strong reaction. So food becomes the site of resistance in Mizoram. That is a major focus in this section. 
this is just took various ways. First, first they started ridiculing, and then secondly, it took, took a powerful moment called Puma Zai. Puma Zai was a song, basically. These, uh, the, the local chiefs started uh, you know, feasting openly and taking rice openly, and it ultimately it became a powerful moment. But in 1910, the missionaries were successful in uh, and also, uh, successful in request, uh, successful in, uh, uh, in implementing through the colonial state the prohibition. The then onwards, the liquor was, that is, rice beer was prohibited. But more important was the 1911 famine, which resulted again, which I discussed in the earlier ch uh, chapter from the food crisis as a result of bumble flowering and rat uh, famine. Now, <coughs> because there are no rice, therefore it was not possible to, uh, you know, feast, to offer the feast in community feasts, etc. And therefore, this moment, uh, you know, ended. But during the labor process, now, the, there was a moment called revival. Then at the moment within Christianity, it came from Wales, then came to the Khasi Hills, then to the Mizoram. This revival was responsible for, uh, you know, uh, making the Christianity indigenized and therefore the process of indigenization of Christianity becomes uh, uh, very powerful and Christianity spreads like wildfire in Mizoram. Now, the the missionaries introduced no practices of food. They, you know, introduced no table manners, no ways of eating, no ways of uh, cooking the food. Though it was not accepted widely, uh, but only the those who got converted and they were in the elite in the uh, uh, society, they accepted this. But gradually the the civil society organization, especially the Mizo Association, which was formed in 1936, and they started exercising their hegemony through this, uh, you know, uh, civilizing process, because machines were interested in civilizing process, civilizing materials, and the way and they also, civil society organization also started civilizing the tribes. And therefore, they abolished, uh, they were the, uh, you know, popular uh, practice of Trangara, which is that the, in the family there used to be a huge plate made of wood and the rice was spread in the center and the uh, cousins, etc., the vegetables, meat, etc., were kept in the center and they used to share the food. Now, this was condemned by the Vayame. According to them, it is an unhealthy practice and therefore uh, it should be abolished. But gradually, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, there was a moment for forging the cultural identity of the people, that is called Mizo identity. So this section deals with the food as a site of identity. And therefore, they revived many of those practices with certain modifications. And Tungara was the one that they reintroduced Tungara in the, especially the, in the festival, in the feasts, etc., in the parties, but with the modification that instead of uh, on the wooden plate or bamboo plate, they spread the plantain leaves and therefore they can share the food. But this was not a uh, practice in the families no longer now, and it was only during the feasting, etc. The last section deals with the food and the memory. How those Muslims who migrated to the other cities, metropolitan cities and other cities for higher education as well as taking up jobs, how they remember their food practices, because they cried for use of food. That again is a long section uh, taking citing various theories of library, the production of space, etc. I have concluded that section. Now, basically, this whole thesis, uh, whole book is divided into two parts. One first part is 
production and distribution which are the first four chapters chapter 5 to 8 are basically consumption practices and i don't with you know creating new taste as a part of the new consumption practices next chapter uh, is on the bakeries how did the mother develop the taste for bakery products when there was an absence of these consumer goods in their tradition how has it become part and parcel of mother food culture in the contemporary mizoram how the colonial and post colonial modernity played a role in the development of this consumption practice these are some of the leading issues moved into the fabric of this chapter basically the bakery uh, you know they used to during colonial time they used to uh, import maida etc Uh, from because they were not wheat producing uh, area, this was not a wheat producing area from Kolkata etc. But when the machinery, because the machinery are needed, uh, uh, when you need machinery and colonial officials as well, when you need of the bread, biscuit etc. etc., they introduce to the local converts those who embrace Christianity. And in fact, biscuit started to be become become. Uh, biscuits and bread and cake started to uh, were taken as a symbol of modernity coming through Christianity, and this is the whole chapter about basically how they perceive it as a symbol of modernity. This is only an ethnography. There is hardly any work. Uh, I have done massive full work, and the next chapter is restaurants. The restaurants is the point in the warfare of cookery, such as Indian. Because it has always been a major instrument for smashing all creating all eating habits. Take a food as a gorilla of cooking. I have taken a name from her. Welden. Uh, is it a valid generalization in the context of development of modern restaurants uh, uh, in Mizoram? How do other social groups in Mizoram perceive the emergence of modern restaurants? How do other people know what we need? Space through the sight of new eateries growing in our own. Such interrogation has been deliberated upon this chapter. Basically, I will trace the history of restaurants right from the colonial times uh, and the whole concept of eating out. Uh, the whole in food history, there is a concept of eating out, dining out, or eating out, and uh, what was the tradition before coming out of the missionaries? How did when they used to go outside? How they used to take food? This is uh, this is discussed in this section. Then how the tea uh, tea stands, etc. Started uh, getting established and how they became popular. What were what were the social, political, and economic factors which were responsible for the creation of modern restaurants and how they have been able to uh, create the public culture. Public culture again is a concept taken from Congo. Uh, public culture in Mizoram. Mizoram. Last chapter is uh, consumption of milk in Mizoram. This chapter seeks to examine how the missionaries endeavoured to turn the Mizoram Christian from lactose intolerant to lactose tolerant. Though they were successful in this attempt to some extent, but it is it is only in the post-colonial period and especially in the last two decades that the milk has been has become an important consumer good in Mizoram. Now, sorry, you need time. I just do one or two anecdotes. Uh, how about because milk was uh, the, the British, uh, the colonial officials as well as the missionaries were in need of milk. And when Mizoram was annexed, there were large the Indian army. There were large number of Nepalis, and they settled them. And Nepalis were asked to start the. Dairy, dairy is basically. In fact, in time of this India, it was the Nepalis uh, who, uh, who migrated from various places who started the uh, dairy tradition in uh, entire Northeast India. Because all the societies, China, entire North, uh, entire Southeast Asia, and Northeast India, 
mainly the hill areas, they were lactose intolerant. They were not used to taking milk. They hated milk. But by the way, there are a number of theories I have discussed that how a lactose intolerant, intolerant society can turn into lactose tolerant in one generation itself through various processes. Now, uh, although I will like not when in the south of Iran, in the area, where they call themselves as Maras, they are too far very ill. And basically, they are in the area, they are doing the name, etc. But they are not able to recover, they have become very weak. The machines are not very deciding that you should be the only. But the class just hated the milk. They never took the milk. So they found the best way to make certain medicine. Medicine and make so. You can end up more than one medicine. And we got recovered. We have taken away the various uh, biological uh, theories how the Rosa Society became lactose. And now, you know, milk is very popular, then I discuss the whole history of uh, milk. Uh, and that's all. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, I can also help me and discuss about my book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Dawan, for touching upon such a highly neglected but uh, very unique and significant topic, uh, research topic in life. Now, uh, from fellowship, uh, we are also organizing uh, uh, various seminars and uh, lecture series. And our next book comes under the, that category. So, uh, there are various contributors uh, in that book. And two people have, uh, two people have edited this book. Professor Pala Mishra uh, from Lucknow University and Professor Pala Dhaman Mukherjee. They both have edited this book. Professor Mishra is not with us, but Professor uh, Pala Dhaman Mukherjee is with us. She teaches at the Department of Physical Studies, School of Arts and Aesthetics, Jamana Nehru University, New Delhi. She holds a PhD from the Oxford University and has held fellowships at the Kirat Institute, Williamstown, USA. South Asia, South Asia Institute, held by Germany, British Academy. Fellowship Goldsmiths College London, Kurs Restoration Institute, Florence, her published works concern Sultras, Classical Sanskrit Aesthetics, Comparative Aesthetics, and Global Higher History. And the book, the, the, the name of the book is Light into Comparative Aesthetics in Cover by Trade. So I invite Professor, uh, Professor Mukherjee, please tell her. Mm, thank you, Akhilesh okay, Shiyant. It's really my privilege to be sharing this podium with such eminent writers. Uh, so this is basically um, um, a seminar volume and um, the theme is Comparative Aesthetics in a Contemporary Frame. And so I'm just going to tell you something from the introduction which lays out the main argument for the whole book. So it gives you an idea. Uh, so Comparative Aesthetics is looked at in terms of two phases. Phase one can be taken back to uh, what I understand as the first post-colonial phase around 1950s, when India had just become uh, you know, independent and there was this whole new euphoria of you know, going back to the past and understanding the tradition, also in terms of its aesthetic theories. And, uh, and the second phase was really from 1990s. That's the time when we usually understand globalization. So that was a time when, uh, again, there was a feeling that the world is coming together through technology, easy travel, and so on. And uh, so the idea was to understand one's culture through a comparative frame, right? So um, basically, we are talking about these two important moments. And um, personally, I think the first moment, which of course, as I said, was a very euphoric moment from 50s, uh, it kind of, that, that enthusiasm lasted only for a decade and a half. It got dissipated because many of the aestheticians in India were still operating from a certain, um, I would say, colonial nationalist frame, and it was very difficult for them to extricate themselves from thinking along those lines, which is why I think there were certain conceptual um, barriers which could not be overcome at that stage. Just to give an example, uh, so since, um, you know, 
freedom was quite new, and there was, as I said, a sense of you know celebration of uh, having the autonomy to look back at one's own past on one's own terms. But one was still thinking in terms of because there were certain um, like notions which were circulating that Indian culture, Indian aesthetics did not have a sense of tragedy. So if Indian aesthetics were very keen to prove this wrong and to claim that even we had tragedy. If the West had minuses, even we had. So this is what I understand as a kind of a limited frame within which aesthetic theories were operating. Um. So well, the second part of the of the uh, title is in a comparative frame, which I think is also very important. And it is important for us to also understand what do we understand by comparative aesthetics in current times, in current geopolitics, when there's so much of violence, so much of religious fundamentalism, all over, not just India, but all over the world. How to make this discipline uh, kind of responsive to our own current crisis? So, it's, so one of the misconception that I would like to dispel at this stage is aesthetics as a term, it's not really about beauty. Aesthetics is something which is also about experience and I would like to draw from uh, a French philosopher's work, um, uh, Jacques Rancière, who has talked about aesthetics along with politics. You cannot dissociate aesthetics from politics. Uh, for example, why is aesthetics political? Because aesthetics teaches you to say certain things feel certain things, understand certain things, as you're walking down you know, the street, we don't actually notice everything. We don't feel everything. We don't see everything because we are working through certain discursive frames which control what we see and what we hear, what we smell. So in that sense, I look at aesthetics in terms of the political. Um, and interestingly, um, the first euphoric moment, which I, I keep coming back to, which is the 50s moment, there was a special issue in the journey of art and art criticism, which is one of the most influential international journal, and there was a special issue in uh, 1965 when many Indian institutions were invited to participate in a dialogue about, at that time it was called Oriental Aesthetics. And so there were some leading names from India. I would just read out their names. Uh, K.C. Pandey, who was a pioneer of comparative aesthetics. P.J. Chaudhary, Lorenzo Kumar. And from the West, there were scholars like Archie Brown, Elliot Deutsch, and Thomas Mondo. They were leading names of the time. And there was this uh, very, very fascinating dialogue which took place at that point, which, as I said, did not go beyond a decade and a half. Now, more recently, uh, there has been an encyclopedia of aesthetics which has come out. Uh, I think the date is 1998, brought uh, out by Michael Kelly, where it's in four volumes, and you open the first volume, and the very first name is Abhinav Gupta. So there is a tremendous importance given to Indian aesthetics, and people have realized it's really part of a very important, discursive, and uh, vibrant intellectual history, which one has to now know at this stage. Uh, so, the, so the Conference of Comparative Aesthetics, of which this publication is a result, is also intended to focus on its present constellation of disciplines in current geopolitics. So we are looking at broad view of aesthetic concerns across disciplines like art history, sociology, philosophy, psychology, literary studies, and linguistics. And the participants of the conference were asked to try to bridge the gap between aesthetics and politics. And um, uh, so some of the important questions which came up at the conference were, um, does Indian aesthetics only signal Sanskrit aesthetics? Under what conditions of knowledge production is there a formation of a canon that is largely dominated by classical Sanskrit aesthetics? Or is this domination just relational? So if you just look at uh, the term intercultural inter comparativism, then you're looking at large national blocks. Like you compare Sanskrit aesthetics with, say, Greek aesthetics. But what if you break up these national blocks and look at Sanskrit aesthetics or Indian aesthetics in terms of 
certain categories which are given within the tradition like Desi and Margi. So these are unique terms which are given by the tradition as analytical categories to study some of these aesthetic theories. So in that sense, we can also raise the question, how come we, not, we don't have terminology or discourse to talk about tribal aesthetics? Because anybody who's familiar with tribal art would, just by looking at the art production, you'll know how tremendously uh, complex that whole, you know, uh, the configuration is, aesthetic thinking is. But it's quite possible that it's, these aesthetic ideas can circulate without its Shilpa Shastras. So how do we deduce their aesthetic theories just by practice? It, they may not have the Shilpa Shastras, but does that does not mean that there are no aesthetic concepts that they are operating within. And the other, uh, one of the contributors has actually uh, uh, written on Indo-Islamic aesthetics, where she looks at uh, the, class, the, the way in which the Deccanist a Deccanese Sultanate South sensibility, uh, for example, Abin Shah's Kitab e Navras, which really talks about Navarasas, but in a very different kind of a conversation. And it also tells us about a certain broad dialogue which is going on between the Navarasas that we are familiar with, Indian aesthetics, classical Sanskrit aesthetics, and the Deccanese Sultanate sensibility of that time. Um, and I would also like to draw uh, your attention to the whole notion of translation. And in, in fact, it is during the Mughal times, when Dara Shiko's time, there were so many Sanskrit texts which were translated. And tremendous amount of scholarship was carried out at that time, which people today forget. You know, we t tend to look at these in very essentialist uh, categories. Uh, and I think what is important for us to understand is it's not the real sign of confidence is not just to look at your own tradition as an insular, you know, given, but it's very important to actually adopt a comparativist framework. That's when dialogue between self and other is possible. Otherwise, one can go on getting caught up in a very, very, you know, provincial and insular frame where you only talk about your own pure past. Whereas the book actually questions the very idea of this kind of purity. Um, so now just let me briefly tell you uh, some of the content of, of the chapters. Of course, since classical Sanskrit aesthetics is also one very important part of this book, there is a lot of focus on the Natya Shastra, on Abhinava Bharti, which is one of the most important commentaries on the Natya Shastra, through which we actually come to know how various interpreters have looked at uh, notions of aesthetic theories. and. Um, and so we go through the, the most of the classical important you know, reference points of aesthetics. For example, um, the Rasa Dhani Alankara of Raja Shekhara, Kuntaka, Mamata, Hemachandra, Vishwanath, and the Viti school of Dandin, Vamana, and so, so all those well-known names are there. Uh, at the same time, what is so new about this volume is the insistence on exchange between aesthetics and politics. What is the aesthetic regime of Shilpa Shastras that define what may or may not be represented in art? So if, even if you go to any painting site or sculpture site, you'll know that the artist cannot look at everything. So there's certain selection at work. So one is raising questions about that selection in terms of inclusion and exclusion along the, uh, the grid of caste and gender. I think we are running short of time, so I'm just going to, um, you know, move to the last concluding section of uh, what I want to say um, and I would like to just draw attention to the the last chapter by by Ajay Shivaprakasha who has looked at Vachanas the poems which are composed by the artisan poets where there's a very interesting correlation between aesthetic labor and their own everyday experience of laboring bodies which really forms within the purview of what we understand as the question of aesthetics and politics. And the final essay resonates with the broader concerns of this volume, which is how to expand aesthetics beyond its classical limits, how to view it as a cultural construct of activity which is as much related with a sense of beauty, sensorial uh, experience, 
epistine as with the questions of power and social hierarchy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Karun. Uh, so, today uh, I would also like to launch our books uh, from this stage. And all the books which have been discussed here, along with, along with that, we are also launching out two more books. Those are made for interest and reforms, learning perspective, authored by Arun Kumar, and some aspects of learning languages by J.C. Sharma Ji. So, we are launching those books from here on this stage. I will ask uh, student authors to please launch the books. Please do the honor. Thank you.